Many times kids are diagnosed with cyanotic heart disease, and a very common condition is a thing called Tetralogy of Fallot. What is Tetralogy of Fallot? Well, Tetralogy of Fallot is the most common cause of having a baby uh, born cyanotic or blue. And all that means is that there's a less than normal level of oxygen in the Are they birth. always blue at birth? Most of the time they're not blue at birth, and in fact many of these babies can go undetected for a period of time. But the natural history of Tetralogy of Fallot is that it is a gradually progressive problem and that the blueness or cyanosis will increase over the course of time. So what does that mean that doc is a bad doc and not picking up right away because it may not be enough signs? No, many times, uh, especially in a small child who's completely asymptomatic, uh, the amount of screening that's done for a child at birth is, is, is relatively small. We don't do extensive testing on every baby that's born because very, very few of them will actually have anything seriously wrong with their heart or any of their other organs for that matter. That routine sonograms they do before babies are born, they, they pick it up sometimes or they don't pick it up? The routine sonogram that's done through mom and through mom's uh, internal organs to reach the baby uh, is a good screening examination, but it's not, it does not give, uh, in many cases, the very fine details of anatomy unless it's done by a specialist who's keyed in on the heart or on the brain or on some of the other organs. So if that's the case, we notice the kid's a little bloom, the doctor sends the kid to a pH cardiologist and he looks at the kid and does a sonogram and a bunch of other things and he says, oh, we got a problem here and he uses this term Tetralogy of Fallot. What does that mean? Well, Tetralogy of Fallot, as we said before, is a common congenital heart uh, problem um, and it really, although it's, it has traditionally been said to have four parts, it really only has two important parts. And the two important parts to Tetralogy of Fallot, and they're really very common to virtually all children that have this, is first of all, there's a very large hole in the wall between the bottom chambers of the heart. And this is such a large hole that it will never close on its own, and blood can easily flow back and forth between the two bottom chambers of the heart. And they call this hole of what? This hole in medical terminology is called a ventricular septal defect. And sometimes that's just all you have in a kid that isn't a trilogy, correct? Well, ventricular septal defects are the most common types of congenital anomalies that children are born with, and many different things can happen when a child is born with a ventricular septal defect. But in many cases, they can close on their own and never require any surgery. But you said something else has to be here. What's that other thing? Well, in tetralogy, in addition to a very large hole, which will not close on its own, we never say never and never say always, but virtually never, the other part of tetralogy is that there's an important blockage to the flow of blood from the right lower pumping chamber of the heart to the lung artery. And that's delivered by what kind of a connection? Well, there's a normal connection in the heart between the right lower pumping chamber and the lung artery, just as there is a normal connection between the left lower pumping chamber and the main circulation, or the aorta. What do they call that connection? Well, the connection between the left ventricle and the aorta is called the aortic valve, and the connection between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, or lung artery, is called the pulmonary valve. Basically, it's a, a pipe that brings blood to the lung? That's correct. It's a large blood vessel, one of some, two of the largest blood vessels in the body. In most normal hearts, they're about the same size. One carries blood to the main circulation, and the other one carries the blood to the lung artery circulation. But there could be other components, because the word tetralogy means more than two. Sometimes you have well, other things. Well, traditionally, tetralogy of Fallot consists of four different parts. The ventricular septal defect, right ventricular hypertrophy, or thickening of the right ventricle, pulmonary stenosis, which is a blockage to the flow of blood from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, and finally, something called overriding of the aorta. And that has to sort of do with complicated medical terminology, but it has to do with the position of the hole in the wall between the bottom chambers of the heart. And if brought to you, at what age would you see the kid, and what can you do for it? Well, most of the time when tetralogy is discovered in a young child, and typically it is discovered in the first month or six weeks of life, and sometimes at birth, um, those children don't generally require any surgical treatment at birth. There are very many exceptions to this. There are children that have severe blueness or cyanosis right at the time of birth, and there are some children who reach the age of teenage years or even beyond and really only develop very mild cyanosis. But typically, most children will develop some cyanosis around the time of birth, 
but will not require any surgical therapy when, around the time of birth. When I say that, I mean the first one to three months of life. Uh, can they sometimes open a valve by stretching it? Valves, valves can be opened and stretched with balloons by the cardiologist in the catheterization laboratory without surgery, at least the traditional type of open surgery. In Tetralogy of Fallot, almost always the type of blockage that the child has is a complicated multi-level blockage that extends from inside the heart through the area of the valve and even above the area of the valve. In addition to that, we don't want to open that connection widely because if we did with that very large hole in the wall between the bottom chambers of the heart, too much blood flow would occur through the lungs and it would be uncontrolled. So it's a balancing act, isn't it? It is, and most patients with tetralogy when they're born are pretty well balanced, but that balance shifts out of their favor as they get older so that um, we have to time the surgery. In Tetralogy of Fallot, surgery is inevitable. It never goes away on its own. It never heals itself, and there's no non-surgical way, really, to treat it. So we know all babies that are born with Tetralogy of Fallot will eventually come to cardiac surgery. And one of the jobs of the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon is for every individual child to pick the safest time at which that child should undergo surgery. Usually, when is that? be considered the safest time at a certain size, age, what? All of those things uh, go into con in consideration. Most babies with Tetralogy of Fallot grow pretty well, so they grow along a normal growth curve. Uh, so small weight is not generally a problem for them. They usually gain weight pretty well. Um, and we know from years uh, of experience that the risk of the operation will generally decrease to be as low as it's going to be by the time the child is three or four months of age. So from the time the child is born, unless there's some unusual circumstance or another illness which intervenes, we generally would tell the parents that they should plan on having the child undergo surgical correction sometime between three and six months of age. We say correct, a, a total correction, a partial correction, what do we do? Well, that's always a, uh, an interesting point in congenital heart surgery. Um, generally speaking, in congenital heart surgery, uh, surgery uh, changes the natural history of the problem. In other words, we do surgery, and that surgery gives the child a more favorable outcome than they would have if they hadn't had surgery. So that sounds like a lot of medical gobbledygook, but basically what it means is that after you've had open heart surgery, for instance, to repair Tetralogy of Fallot, you're not cured in the strict medical sense of the word. You may have to take medications, you require medical follow-up throughout your lifetime, and there are always a possibility that some other things may happen in the future which may require surgery. This is actually very rare in Tetralogy, but it can happen that patients will require surgery in childhood or occasionally in adulthood as a follow-up. So we don't really define that as a cure. You have a patch inside your heart, you've had some scars in your heart, you have a scar on the outside of your chest, so you are much better off than you would be if you still had tetralogy. But cure, our definition of cure is that you, it, it's just as if you never had the illness to begin with. And if you do the surgery, generally the life expectancy is normal or a little less than normal, what would you say? Well, uh, the surgery for this type of problem is an evolving thing. We don't do it now the way we did it 15 or 20 years ago and certainly not the way it was done 40 years ago. So um, the patients that are being operated on now and the ones that were operated on the last 10 or 15 years will serve as the standard for the answer to that question. But generally speaking, patients who've had surgery for Tetralogy of Fallot have a very normal life. Most of them do not require any medications. They don't have any particular restrictions in life. Some of them may have some limitations at extremes of exercise, but for most of the normal types of activities that most people and children do every day, there's no limitations whatsoever. Thank you very much.